My name is Ethan Cowgill. I'm a field lead out in Wyoming right now for the Cincinnati Museum Center. And we're out here exploring a group of rocks that are about 72 million years old that have not been really thoroughly looked at or sampled from in 80 or 90 years. So this is a late Cretaceous assemblage of dinosaurs, turtles, mammals, birds, pterosaurs, and the like. And in the past few days here, we've been pretty surprised because we've assembled a pretty sweet menagerie of the, the animals that lived here. It's not just dinosaurs either. At a site we call Turtle Hill, just about a mile from here, we found some of these beautiful fish vertebrae, which to my knowledge are some of the first from this formation. The rocks from elsewhere in North America at this time, a little bit before, a little younger, are pretty well sampled. But for some reason or other, the rocks in Wyoming of this time are very poorly sampled. So we have a good chance of finding many new kinds of dinosaurs and other animals here, like this guy. This is a turtle, a freshwater turtle. Not sure what kind yet. Up here, this is carapace, this is shell. Here's the outside of the shell. And turtles have a very characteristic pattern where this is very smooth and shiny and it's got this pitted sort of golf ball-like texture. Here is a rib head from a turtle, another noticeable bone. And then this is some kind of limb end, it looks like, but I'm not sure. I don't know my turtles as well as I know my dinosaurs. So these are both firsts so far. This thing is pretty cool. Another non-dinosaur, but still very sweet. This is likely a small crocodilian of some kind. And it's the lower jaw. And those are all little tooth sockets in there. The teeth have fallen out. But it is a fantastically beautiful, well-preserved jawbone. Little holes in there, the sockets. This is one of the first days my volunteer handed me that fragment and said, is this a fossil? And I'm like, that's a jaw. And as soon as I said that, he looked down and he said, like this one? And so in the exact same spot, we found two jaws in two seconds. This is the lower jaw of what looks to me to be like an herbivorous dinosaur, a relatively small one. So this is all concretion and ironstone, but you can see lodged in here, on the top here is a fairly chundered, fairly eroded dinosaur jawbone, here are all the sockets. And you can see fragments of teeth in there, and those fragments look like an ornithopod jaw, kind of small plant eater. And we have what looks to be a lot more of a skeleton to go and collect still. This was something that we got on the first day, which made my hopes very, very high. This is a fragment of a horn from a large ceratopsian dinosaur. So this here is rock, cemented, concreted to the bone, and then this is the inside, so it's been broken, and it's very incomplete. But this is the outside, outer wall of the horn, and you can tell it's a horn because in cross-section, when you make it symmetrical, it's this perfectly round shape. It's tapering upward. The inside looks like a ceratopsian horn, and the outside is covered in these, all these grooves called vascular sulci. They're basically just big vein impressions which the horns and spikes and frills of ceratopsians often have. So we combed this whole area looking for a source for this, desperately pleading that this is not an isolated element, and we still have not found the source. We found some other bone fragments, but we couldn't find the exact layer it was coming from. So maybe in another year, Father Rain will have eroded enough so we can get our skull. Speaking of skulls, this one, this is a pretty fantastic this is probably the highlight, I think, so far. Just he behind us is where our camp is. And our camp is set up right against this giant hill behind us. And at the very top of this hill, at the skyline, I was called up by one of my volunteers, who is an absolute beast of a field man. And he said, what is this? Handed this to me. And I said, that's a jaw. So we now have another jaw. This is also a plant-eating dinosaur. It's covered in lichen. It's really poorly preserved. But this is the ironstone covering the outside, but all this gray is bone. And then all of these things are tooth sockets, and these shiny things in there are teeth. So it's, this, this piece is not in great shape, but it is identifiable. And once we clean the rock off of this side, hopefully the other side is not quite so poorly preserved. But then right next to that was something much bigger, much bigger find. This right here is from the exact same specimen, almost certainly. And this is also a little hard to see because it's covered in rock. But what we have here is the upper jaw or maxilla bone 
of one of these giant duck-billed dinosaurs. So these are also, also little tooth sockets. And then this, this shelf here is also all bone. And then this is rock, but this shelf of bone is connected to this. And then this comes up here, and you've got bone in the back, and bone on the side, and bone right there. So I'm confident that there's a fairly well-preserved maxilla bone in this block. But the cool thing about this is when you flip it over, it is completely unrecognizable. So we've been walking past tens of thousands of these little sandstone pieces and never thought to flip them. But when one of our volunteers flipped them, he got a skull on the other side. And it looks like there's more of this animal going into the hill. So once we have an excavation permit, we'll go up and we will thoroughly search for the rest of this guy. This is the, only the second duck-billed dinosaur skull to be found in the almond formation. And once we prep it up, I'm sure it's gonna look a lot nicer. Around that skull were thousands of bone fragments, thousands, because it's just been eroding on the surface for maybe a few centuries. But hopefully, back in the lab, I'll be able to put all this together. Not all of it, but maybe some decent, find some decent fits. It's quite a puzzle piece. But uh, I think the reward will be worth it if we can get a decent, a decent dinosaur skull. And uh, I can go show you the other fossil here. The big one. This was our Jurassic Park moment. One of our volunteers was walking around and he saw some gigantic bone fragments on the surface. And he called me over and we were jumping up and down because this is the first time we found like relatively decent fossils here on this trip. And so we start walking, following it up the hill, looking for more fragments to find a source. And we couldn't find anything. We were so frustrated because the pieces looked too big and too good to not lead to something. So what we decided was we would just clean the entire area with our brushes, find the source of ro the rock layer that this is coming out of, and then we can try to start excavating. But we cleaned it up, cleaned it up, cleaned it up, and found nothing going in. And so we were like pulling our hair out, thinking there must be a source somewhere. If it's not here, where is it? And just then, I picked up a slab by one of the seams, and I pulled it up, and right underneath it, pff, a pile of bones exploded. And then that pile of little bones was the center of a giant dinosaur limb bone. So this is either a tyrannosaur limb or an ornithopod, or a big duck-billed dinosaur, like the skull we saw earlier. I'll have to clean it up in the lab before we can figure that out. There's a good number of features that can differentiate the two. We looked like uh, grave, grave robbers on the way out. We were just scrambling down at like 7 a.m. trying to get there before any of the locals saw this big white blob sticking out of the hill. But uh, we got her out and I'm gonna cap this side with plaster too so we can travel to Cincinnati and be, be nice and safe. And then in the lab we'll figure out what she really is. There's other bones in the quarry too. So if this turns into a big excavation, we might get, have a good shot at getting a significant amount of this animal, which would be fantastic. So it took about two work days to fully get around this fossil and plaster it, but the problem was it's extremely fragile. So every single time we would, another bit of it would be exposed, all the bone on the surface would just start to sag. And so it was like a constant applying of glue, trying to, be, trying to cut as much rock off of it to reduce the weight of the block without sacrificing the structural integrity. There was one point in the middle where it was very frightening. So these represent... Um, uh, these, these are both pedestals. So this was flipped over in the ground and we were jacketing the top or the other side. And so I, we carved a hole underneath here to wrap uh, uh, plaster soaked burlap through it. And we were afraid that as we started to apply the plaster and rub it in, that that pressure alone, just one pair of hands or two pairs of hands could just crush the entire block. It was very frustrating. But uh, it was stronger than we thought and we had no, no complications getting it out. So we're very lucky. I've definitely seen plaster flips where somebody jackets the top of something and then assumes that they undercut it enough and then flips it over and then like a skull pours out or something um, and they have to pick up all the little fragments that would have just been saved in the lab, but we were lucky this time. The back of the knees, boys. That's where it counts. Wow, made that mistake. Yep. It's mango season. It's mango season. Mango season, boys. Mangoes are ripe. Mango's are ripe. What in tar nation? Good to go. Good to go. Awesome. Logan, you ready? This is all a big piece of bone. I'm looking forward to see where that goes. Ooh, this is so flexible. I think that is bone. Look at that. Yeah. See, all the rock that is not bone, that it holds the bone together and is, acts as a little natural cradle for it, 
for 72 million years. All that is matrix. Paleontology is 90% sweeping dirt, 10% dinosaurs. Isn't that a great ratio? All that practice in the sandbox. Yep, it's paying off now. Oh yeah. Wow. We are about 100 feet from the edge of the BLM section. Wow. Yeah, all that's of our crazy. sites are barely within the boundaries. We're that's crazy. That's probably what I was hitting. It's a huge chunk of bone. I thought it was just a nodule. Oh my. Yeah. Open that up again, please. Awesome. We're going to build a little pedestal of rock around the fossil so that we may build a little plaster cast for it, just like a broken arm. That way, as we bring it out of here and drive it away, it's not going to shatter or break. If anything moves or anything, if you see any cracks develop, you tell me. Yeah. It's a big bone. If it is a limb, it's a big limb. There would have been a giant inland seaway called the Western Interior Seaway that carved from the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic Ocean. So this would have been continental shelf, basically. So these dinosaurs lived on this thin strip of floodplain between the mountains to the west and the ocean just east of here. So we're basically at the border. We're basically at the edge of land. Um, so these dinosaurs are being deposited in anywhere from shallow marine to swamps to floodplains and deltas. Some of them are getting washed out to sea. Most of them are just dying and being washed into lakes or rivers. Um, but it would have been subtropical, probably. Pretty hot all year round. Nice and balmy. Wall to wall Jamaica. And there would have been pterosaurs above, and little mammals below, and a whole suite of dinosaurs. Like whatever the hell this thing is. Like, uh, I'll just show you. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that is neat. Yeah. Could be anything though. Yeah, really could. Could be some good bones here, though. Just exploded everywhere. This is a good site. We got piles of bones here, piles of fragments. Pretty nondescript right now. Yeah. All this is good for is taking us to a source. These are all pieces here. Wow. Piled up by the rain. Probably right around here. This big piece. And this. We should also rank each one with a priority level. So maybe like out of five, as far as how promising it is. So maybe this is a three. Yeah, I'd say that. And five is like giant bones in the hill, for sure come back ASAP. It's named after a stagecoach station nearby. An old stagecoach, but uh, I don't know why the stagecoach is called that either. Formations are usually named after uh, hey, bodies of water, or rivers, or local landmarks. So like Hell Creek is a creek, you know? These look like some good badlands up ahead. Some good exposures. You know, you'll get to see, potentially, if we find enough, evolution within species through time in the same area which would be pretty great. Yeah, it goes rock, 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 bone. Rock, 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 bone. Yay, rock, rock, rock. The tempo, the, the time signature is pretty weird, but it's a song. Now we're just looking for fragments, basically.
storm's coming in. Ooh, this is a beautiful leaf. Wow. That's fantastic. That is stupid. Yeah. I appreciate how far away from you saw that. It'd be cool to get some really nice plants. I'd love to collect some of those. Yeah. To go along with this. something you keep? Uh, we might keep that one because it's particularly nice. That is particularly nice. I've seen whole Triceratops skulls completely embedded in these nodules. Wow. It's pretty horrific. Yeah. I they're a nightmare to prepare. For extraction. Yeah. And they're heavy too. But uh, our bones are kind of consistently found either in or immediately below those concretions. Bottle rocket. So, so far we've gotten a lot of hadrosaur material, a little bit of a ceratopsian, hopefully more. So we have two of the big four. So hopefully on this trip, we'll be able to come back with some, some amount of a uh, carnivorous dinosaur and an armored dinosaur. Way more than we expected to collect at all in the beginning. And the first couple of days were pretty, pretty bare, but by the third day, it just became hard to ignore. Every day, one of the two sides would come back with something really cool. And uh, we've really had no shortage of things to collect, surprisingly. Projects like this are kind of an endangered species in and of themselves, because people have been collecting in Western North America for so long. But, uh, so we're running out of places like this, where it's basically just you can come here and have a field day, and basically everything you collect is scientifically significant or new. Um, those places still exist, but rarely are they as accessible as this, and rarely are they in Western North America. So this might be like one of the last generations where you can come out, and there's no, not a real shortage yet of places like this where you can go and collect things that are basically all firsts. So we feel pretty lucky. At this rate, we could be going for 10 years and not even be close to finishing. Um, to getting a real solid picture of what the, uh, the fauna and flora of this place used to be like. And I think this place's biggest utility is in trying to reconstruct what the environments in Western North America used to be like when there was a seaway cutting the continent down the middle and there was only a tiny strip of habitat that would wax and wane with the seaway. And on that tiny strip of habitat is where 10 to 15 million years worth of these Tyrannosaur, Ceratopsian, Duckbill, Ankylosaur ecosystems flourished and regenerated and changed over time. So what we're starting to really put together here in Western North America, with a lot of the work being done in Grand Staircase in Utah, which has produced in the past 15 years an entirely new a, a series of ecosystems, of dinosaur ecosystems, what we're really all starting to assemble here is an extremely coherent and complete record of what the earth was like when the climate was very different from what it is now. And dinosaurs were around for 160 million years in the non-bird form, at least. And we have started to reconstruct, and this place is gonna be one of the most key uh, contributors to this story, started to reconstruct what the last 15 million years of the age of dinosaurs was like in one place, in one strip of habitat. And it's, it's a record that's gonna be so complete, I think it'll be it, it's a really a fantastic example of figuring out how evolution actually works on a fundamental level. I mean, we know that there's natural selection and sexual selection and artificial selection and genetic drift and all these other things. We know these things all occur and contribute to evolution, but actual case studies of figuring out exactly what the environmental triggers are for organisms evolving and changing and adapting over time, we know surprisingly little about how most of the evolution has occurred, by which means. Um, and this story in Western North America, while it is fun to just come out and hang out in the wilderness and collect dinosaur bones, what it's really doing uh, on a deeper level is giving us an extremely clear picture, slowly, slowly, piece by piece. Every time we find a new lizard or dinosaur or bird or plant or turtle, we're slowly filling in a picture that will hopefully, it, th this century, be one of the sharpest and clearest pictures, one of the best windows into figuring out how life actually works on an evolutionary level. And the implications of that are extraordinary. Uh, it could explain so much about how, how life has unfolded.
um, because we've got such a fantastic record. And places like this, we're running out of them, but they're amazing because you can come here and contribute to that story. And so that's what we're, that's what we're up to. <laughs> Take a drive under the moon. Let's take a drive under the somber sky. Let's take a drive under the moon tonight. Let's take a drive under the moon. The sleeping small towns will pass by. Like the months you've been away Let's catch up our lives In the hours till day Let's take a drive under the moon Let's take a drive under the somber sky Let's take a drive under the moon Take a drive under the moon Oh